take somebody's hand if you will and nothing at all Father as we touch one another we thank you again for your allowing us into this gathering place we realize Lord that we're not only in your presence when we come here but in your presence wherever we are but we thank you for this gathering place we pray now, Lord, that you bless the hands we hold. Touch my brother and my sister in a very special way. Lift them above and beyond. Everything that troubles and everything that is of the devil, lift us above everything that is of the flesh and give us victory as the new man emerges more and more and more and more in our lives that will go from glory to glory as you reveal yourself to us. And we claim the victory right now. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It's offering time. Amen. We honor you and we honor the Lord. We thank God for everyone. And as you get your gift, everyone who can get a $10 gift in your hand tonight. Get a $10 gift. It's unto the Lord. A $10 gift. That's unto the Lord. And uh, let us be generous. We're doing so many things, Lord knows. And uh, we just leave it to the mature, to those who are mature in the Lord to understand that it takes money to operate and to move. And, and if we just do as the Lord has requested, then, then everything will be just fine. Got to work a little smarter this year. Yeah, I don't don't have the energy to keep doing what I've been doing. Just got to work just a little smarter. Amen. Go less. Start to write. Deal with being a father instead of a brother. All right, <laughs> Amen. Got to got to move. Got to move. Teach me to number my days. Got to know how to operate. On the first, I have to run to Seattle. Another friend of mine passed, and so I've got to, yes, yes, I've got to go do his homegoing celebration. Now that's four in a month. I've got to get back in on the eighth to make sure I get to the celebration of life for another friend's son. Heir to four billion plus dollars died at 27. <laughs> so, uh, yes, Father, we thank you for everything. Bless every giver. Bless those who have to give but have not to anything to give. Multiply whatever comes in to make this whole place work. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Uh, I like that song. Huh? That's what he wants, so praise the Lord. Oh, he said, Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I want, want everything. everything. Or nothing at all. Or nothing at all. Sound man, make it a little bit more lush for me. Oh, here's the thing. I want, I want everything. I nothing at all. I want your mind. I want your soul. I want your spirit. Yeah. 
Yes, Lord, we worship you, God, with our substance. We thank you for these tithes and these offerings. We thank you for your spirit today, God. Your anointing, let it rest in this place, God. Today, in Jesus' name, we pray. Te damos gracias, Señor. Por lo que haces en nuestras vidas. Te damos gracias por todo. En el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amen. I want everything. Uh, or nothing at all. In St. John chapter 11, and we thank God for uh, newlywed Dr. Wesley Johnson being with us. Amen. 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 <laughs> thank God. Uh, but I know in 2211 that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way, called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The master is come, and call it for thee. Uh, did you see anywhere where he called for her? Uh, uh, as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. Now, tonight... We, we can reiterate just a couple of things real quick and, uh, and then move uh, to where I think the exegetical progress calls for us to go. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. One of the things that I've noticed in, in all of us, and particularly the, the writers of the scriptures make it very clear that we understand the human aspect of any and every believer because many times we like we do in funerals and other catastrophic things we act as if believers aren't human many instances, uh, one of the great problems and one of the things that really feed the judgmental disposition of people in church is that some people are trying to give the impression that they don't have the stress of being human in a spiritual environment. And it feeds into, you know, it's really an immature Christian who uh, fails to understand the humanity of believing and operating in the sphere of what is spiritual. I, I wish that we could all completely negate the, the flesh and the human aspect and just walk in here uh, like angels and have some supernatural understanding of how we navigate without the battle of the flesh. But the reality is that we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. And this earthen vessel has a way of showing itself and expressing itself at times when we don't want it to express itself and at times when we have not yet matured enough to bring it all under control. Uh, we still lose our tempers. And then we still get hurt about things that we should have complete victory over. We should be completely insensitive to certain things uh, that Satan has thrown our way for years and years, but we still have those struggles. Uh, one of the greatest struggles that we have is sensual perception in opposition to faith. And that is the reality of our environment 
and what it is we're trying to believe God for. The sensual perception, that that connects me to my world and my situation, as opposed to faith that connects me to God's word and revelation. There are times when the stress and the difficulties of life are so difficult that anything that relates to what God says seems to be so far away. I say that very carefully, very slowly. Uh, I should say seal and let it absorb. There are times when the jolt is so, so drastic, so hard, so sudden that in the moment you are almost thrown off balance spiritually. And in many instances, in all instances, we literally have to be caught by the word and the Holy Spirit. In cases like that, if we did not have a chest full or a refrigerator full or, or a truck full of the word of God, we would have slipped into oblivion spiritually because of the jolt that came upon us in such a manner that it shook the very foundation on which we stood. Many people don't want to accept it because we want to give the impression to others. You, you got to forget others. You, you just got to forget others. Because many of the battles that we have, we have to have the battle with ourselves. And other people that are just on looking. And they're onlookers because at that moment, they don't have the sensual perception in total opposition to what we want to believe God for. It is human to vacillate and to have vicissitudinous attitudes about something that's going on in your life. It is human to feel one minute that I got the victory. And the next minute, I'm not so sure. And the next minute, it looks like I'm falling apart. It's human. It's a part of the journey. It's a part of what God is exacting and, and pulling from us. I remember uh, as a young man uh, coming along and I'm out on the road. I'm married on the road, I'm in my 20s, uh, uh, 30s, uh, when, you know, those days, you, you, your libido is a little bit more, uh, you know, it's a little higher temperature than when you're, when you're in your 50s, 60s, well, for some of us, and, uh, and, and certainly when you're pushing 70, uh, it, the intensity just isn't there. And uh, in my 30s, I was on the road, and of course, being gone all the time, my, uh, you know, she wasn't happy with me being gone, so that, you know, she wasn't happy to see me coming and all of that stuff, and things were not as they should be for a fellow who was nine to five. You know, that's a little bit better. You know where he is, he's in front of the TV, he's watching. We don't have to speculate as to what he's doing if he's, uh, 2,000, 3,000 miles away, uh, you know, and all of that good stuff. Uh, I would hear one of the pastors uh, in, in, in one city, he would say to me all the time, uh, oh, I can handle it. I, I, I can handle all of those kind of things and be in a way that the Lord has given me the victory and I can handle and I can be hugged by anybody. Uh, at those times when I needed to be home, I didn't want anybody hugging me. <laughs> you know, hugging because uh, it sends things that I didn't want to feel uh, when I needed to be home. 
and I made the mistake to talk to someone who I thought would give me some good advice, and his word was, he could handle it, as if something was wrong with me. Because I'm saying to him, this is getting a little bit difficult, and I'm out here on the road. And he said, well, I, you know, the Lord, is a, uh, and he just went into this, you know. Now, one of the problems with acting as if you're superhuman when you're dealing with somebody who's young who needs to understand the truth and especially and particularly uh, a, a curious kind of individual like me after he made that speech it called for investigation So uh, the CIA came up and discovered that he wasn't all that right. <laughs> See, the first thing that all of us have to admit is that there is a struggle. There is a struggle in believing God particularly when you have been jolted by something you needed, didn't expect, or when you understand that God could have simply moved you around this challenge, and that's what Martha's position is. If you had been here, my brother would not have died, as if to suggest that death was Jesus' fault. The death was not Jesus' fault, but he allowed it. And he didn't stop it. And he didn't stop it because he wanted to reveal something to them. He wanted to take them to another level. And taking them to another level has given us over the centuries comfort about death. He didn't do it just for their sakes. He did it for every Christian that would ever live after their time because his revelation to them helps us to get through all the home going services that we do. He is saying, I'm using you as an example for everybody that's going to follow who will be able to get up and declare, I am the resurrection and the life. I had to use you to bring that out. Now, understand, even when he's taking us to the next level, we have a struggle. Because that's what next level is about. Being strapped. How do I take you to the next level if I don't introduce discomfort where you are? How do I take you to the next level without a challenge? And the intensity of the challenge is in direct proportion to the size of the step that you're going to take. Oh, they're baby steps in Christ, but they're giant steps too. But a giant step necessitates a giant challenge. You're not going to move to that next level without having a test. And that test is going to be in direct proportion to how high that next level is. Oh, I feel. Uh, you, show me your, you show me your strength by your test. He's, he's taking it to people that he spent a lot of time time with he's not doing this with the woman of the issue of blood they have just touched he's not doing this with the lepers they have just touched he's not doing this with anybody that he has not spent a lot of time with and still after having spent a lot of time with them what happened was a challenge 
Because now we're dealing with where you have to bring ultimate faith. Death. You don't help God in death. You can't take any kind of credit when it comes to raising the dead. It's no credit. You pray and you ask God for a job. You say, Lord, I need a job. And you apply. You applied. Your faith moved you to apply. So your faith stimulated and energized you to take an action. You ask God for a house. Your faith energizes you to start saving your money and getting your credit straight. You are involved in the process of the job of studying the school. Lord, help me to pass a test. Lord, give me a degree. Lord, I want a PhD. But part of that is you have to study. Amen. I'm getting ready to preach, uh, getting ready to teach. I say, Lord, let it be a blessing to someone. Let it be a blessing to the saints. But I have to study. I have to involve myself. Now, death and believing that he'll raise him from the dead. She has no power in that. The most she can do is respond when he says, show me where you have laid. And hear her response to that. Lord, he stinks. In other words, she's even having a challenge with taking him there. I, I, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, have you, have you documented your last challenge? Or maybe the challenge is so intense and it's so embedded in your memory banks that you don't have to document it. Have you ever had a struggle that you don't have to document? Because it's ever before you. I remember the day, the hour, and the minute. When I was faced with what I thought was catastrophic. And I had to believe God. And I believed him, then I didn't believe, then I believed, then I didn't believe. How many times have the Lord say to his disciples, uh, why didst thou doubt? Peter's walking on the water, doing just fine. A bold statement. If it be thou biddest me to come unto thee. And he stepped out. You said he walked on the water. I said he walked on the word. And while he's walking on the word, he starts looking around. How many times have we looked around? It is in the looking around that we lose that focus. He's just saying essentially to her, look at me, focus on me. Didn't I tell you? You know how many times God had to tell me, didn't I tell you? Huh? Didn't I tell you? 
I'd work it out. Didn't I tell you? Why are you running around here crying and complaining? Didn't I tell you? And I've heard it so many times I can't even count it. Didn't I tell you? Feeling good one minute, think it's going to work out. Think the case is going to be solved. Think the money is going to come in. Think the individual is going to be healed. Think the door is going to open. Think the way is going to be made. And I think it, then I don't think it. And I think it, then I don't think it. So I have to hear, didn't I tell you? You know how you hear, didn't I tell you? When somebody comes along preaching or talking or, and confirm. Yeah. See, a confirmation many times is a didn't I tell you. When somebody who doesn't know your business gets right in the middle of your business with an encouraging word, it's like a didn't I tell you. How many folk do I have to send to confirm what I told you? If you would just believe it and walk in it. I see the woman's vacillation. And she's got to struggle. And, and, it's, and it's, it, it shows her humanity. And yet it expresses the power of God. And it exhibits his patience. God having to be patient and long-suffering with a believer. Oh, you think long-suffering is for sinners. God has to be long-suffering with believers, with folk in his camp. Yes, yes, question. Yes. Uh, somebody defined humanism as opposed to humanistic qualities. There's a slight difference, but uh, we understand what you're saying. Uh, without a doubt. Without a doubt, without a doubt, it was one of the most comforting scriptures for me in my life. It was one of the most comforting scriptures for me because I grew up in, a, in, in, in Heil Hitler, the fewer uh, kind of a church. I grew, up, I grew up under heavy manners. The manners were sitting on top of my head. I, I grew up where the sword... Damocles was hanging over your head every day. I grew up, I grew up, you don't even come close. You tell me what was sin in your church, and I'll give you, and I'll up you one. I'll up you one. Two scriptures blessed me to show that my struggle was authentic. Sound oxymoronic. My struggle was authentic. And one of the things that go wrong, so wrong, in a Pentecostal environment, you Baptists don't know it. And that is they kept sending you back to the altar. You can imagine how many times I went back. Oh, you didn't get it right. As if to suggest that when you get the Holy Spirit right, you have no struggle. And, and it was a waste of time. Because what they should have said is, you are going to struggle with some things. There were some things where the Lord took, oh, he took the alcohol taste right out of my mouth when I got saved. Uh, he took the cigarette smoking right out of my mouth. The Lord took the taste. Well, he didn't take the taste out of everybody's mouth. Uh, I might as well work with, I'm going to work with this thing. Amen. He didn't snatch the taste out of everybody's mouth. 
Some never felt like it anymore. Others struggle with it. I grew up in a situation that was, uh, they asked me on the interview the other night, they said, well, why, why preaching? Why, why, why the stimulation and why the intensity? I said, because of the way I grew up. I, I couldn't reconcile some things, and Bible was all around us. And there were certain things I just couldn't reconcile. I couldn't understand, even as a child. It didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense that the Lord would die on the cross, give his only begotten son, shed his blood for me, and then want to sneak in and catch me not ready. Oh, he's going to come in uh, unaware. And just as soon as you step out, he's going to come in as a thief in the night and, 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 and all of that thief in the night stuff and, and, and scare you to death. And oh, the Lord, and, and so you, 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 then when you step out and do something and do something wrong and the judgment doesn't come down, then you, oh, hell. <laughs> Ain't nothing happening here. Ain't nothing going on. You know, you do something wrong, you're looking for him. But then you don't see him. So you go a little deeper. You, you follow what I'm saying? It, 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 it had nothing to do with relationship. It, it had a lot of rules. But the key to a Christian walk is a relationship with God. It's having a relationship, understanding. And in any relationship, there is instruction, there is forgiveness, there is patience, there is long-suffering. In any relationship, there are a series of things that go wrong that you have to make right. There are a series of things that you've got to upfront and confront. There are a series of things that you don't confront right now, but you confront later. There are a series of things that you have to talk about. There are a series of things you have to admit. You can't have a good relationship and not admit certain things about yourself in the middle of the relationship and how things are brought out. Uh, oh God, many times I didn't know there were certain things in me until I got into a relationship. Then the relationship brought out some stuff that I didn't know existed and that's what it's about. Then I gotta forgive myself. Then I gotta forgive you. Then I gotta be patient. Then I gotta instruct. Then I gotta love. Then I gotta hold. Then I, oh they didn't teach that. They taught rules. And then you were guilty because you couldn't keep the rules. And they kept the guilt over your head. So you thought you were the only one struggling. Then later, certain revelation comes out about the people that you thought were walking the straight and narrow. My mother heard some things about her idol who she thought was the most holy of holies. And in her late life, some things came to light that she would never have thought of. And, then, and I wish they hadn't have told her. wish they hadn't told her. The question is, do you allow people to go on with, I, I almost call it hallucination. <laughs> because it, so, do you allow them to go on through their life and, and be blind of the facts? And sometimes not saying something it's better than exposing it because she was at a stage in her life where she was settled. Now to, for her emotions to be disrupted. Struggle. When Jesus was in Gethsemane, 
Now, Gethsemane is the garden. Now, he had more power, it would seem, in the wilderness. Consider the place. Power in the wilderness, struggle in the garden. Maybe you have more power in your wilderness experience than you have in your garden. What am I saying? I'm saying most of us have had the victory when things were rough. But when we got affluent, we got comfortable. We were dedicated when we were poor. Love and worship the Lord when we were struggling financially. But when we got into the garden. See, in the, in the wilderness, you fight the devil. In the garden, you fight the flesh. the garden you fight in flesh Thank you. See, the devil ain't messing with your money now he ain't messing with where you live he's not messing with all the things you could do now that you have money that you couldn't do when you were broke Broke keep a whole lot of folks saved. Uh, baby, let's go over to uh, let's go over to Amsterdam. I can't afford it. <laughs> Thank God you can't afford it. Because Amsterdam is going to present another set of challenges. Especially for the vacation person. Looking for something to get into in the vacation. Mm -hmm. Can't afford it, gotta stay home. So what can you afford to do? Go to church. The garden was a challenge because when you're fighting the devil, you call on God to help. But when God is your challenge, who do you call? In his wilderness, it is written, it is written, it is written. But there was no it is written in the garden when God is demanding all of him. All of him. And he's saying in a sense like, like, like if thou had been here my brother would not have died in a sense what you're getting is I know you I've been with you through eternity I know you can find another way I know you can save them another way now notice the power and notice his Prediction, his prophetic word. Notice his whole life is leading to this cross. Notice he's called the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. 
Notice you can't take my life. I lay it down and pick it up when I get ready. Notice all of that in a general sense. But when you come to the specific time and the specific hour, talk all you want to in the testimony service. Talk all you want to and brag about how close you are to God and judge everybody you see around you. But when your hour comes, When that moment comes when you're facing dead on to the challenge and then you know God and you know he can move it and he chooses not to move it and you end up having to go and pray three times and come back and finally you don't concede that you want to do it. Jesus did not concede that he wanted to do it. His final word was, nevertheless. Not my will. But thy will be done. I don't care. Man, make me mad. People sit around and act as if they're just sailing through here without a battle, without a struggle. Come on, don't buy into that. I don't care how holy they look. They can come in here with a robe on, with a big crown on their heads, big old staff and walking. And nevertheless, I don't want to do it, but I'll do it for you. Amen. Isn't that the part of our lives? That's relationship. Come on, talk to me, saints. That's relationship. Relationship often says, I'm not, I don't want to do this, but I'll do it because I'm with you. That's relationship. That's what we call love, isn't it? That's what we call self-sacrifice. You can't have a relationship and not have self-sacrifice. I get married tomorrow. You know what that means? That means some people who come to my house now can't come. Period. Some phone calls that I can call now I won't be able to call. Unless it's serious business. It can't be, hey, how you doing? What's going on? You know, you can't. ain't none of that. Can't be hanging out after church. They, uh, man, they playing some music over such and such. Let's go. All right, let's go, let's go. Uh, you know, that's over. I'm in, I'm in Seoul, Korea. If I want to go to Japan, to Tokyo, all I do is call a travel agent, get the flight, and I'm gone. If I want to go to New York, I want to go anywhere. Now I got to call headquarters. That's relationship. That's relationship. Relationship is communication. Relationship is opening in your heart. And the father and the son would not have had a relationship if Jesus couldn't have said what he said. And when you have a relationship with God, you are free to say to God what you have in your heart. And if you don't say it, he knows it anyway. Our freedom has been restricted by the church people. By us trying to impress. So most of the time, we are so far gone. Because we couldn't open up. 
And by the time somebody finds us, we are all broken in, in, in splinters because we held on to something that was destroying us because we couldn't express it. Amen. That's why he says confession is good for the soul. To be able to speak it, to be able to be transparent. Transparency, church people duck it. Think you're mad. I got up to the funeral, I told him, I said, when I, you know, it's all the bishops sitting there, I know, I know what's going on in their minds. So I'm just going to, I'm going to release it for them. I'm just going to release it. And I just simply got him and said, hey, I know I'm the most controversial person here. Controversy follows me everywhere. And the people I choose to be around, the things I choose to do, I am the most controversial person here. So I needed the Bishop Clarence Moore to talk to. I needed him to talk to. And I list the fellows I talked to over the period of my ministry. Then I looked around at the crowd that was behind me, and I said, and I don't see anybody here that I could talk to after this. Now, everybody's diffused. Ain't no sense in whispering about me when I already said it. <laughs> Confession is good for the soul. It releases you. It releases you. I've been in church all my life. For 70 years. Been in church. So, church people, don't fool me. And I say like Shakespeare say, me think thou protestest too much. Always in the middle of a judgmental journey. It's not being able to accept who you are. Jesus released me when he was on Calvary. And he said, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? I was told never to question God. I found that when he pushes me into questioning, he's taking me to another level. Oh. He pushes me into question because questioning means I'm at a stage that I don't understand. And the reason he's got me at a stage where I don't understand is because he's about to give me an understanding. And if I had never been brought to the place that I didn't understand, I would never get a revelation of that space. So I'd be walking around eventless and revelationless. Walking around situationless and revelationless. Because he reveals himself in situations. And he has a way of making or creating the situation in order to give the revelation. He creates it. Because he manages the manifestative degrees. Hair a little. There it is. Here a little, there a little. In your life. Because you can't absorb it all at one time. It's going to take eternity for you to grasp who he is. 
Just the grace of God. When you read Paul talk about grace, he says eternity is going to reveal the depth of his grace. You got to live forever. Oh, you think you're going to be bored with him? After a million years, I know in our time. No, it'll be an everlasting revelation of who God is. And if that is the case, it is understandable why I don't understand what he's doing with me from time to time. I struggle. I'm getting ready to close. The reason I know I'm saved is because I struggle. There's a time in my life there was no struggle. Oh, no struggle. Whatever, whatever my flesh said, do I do? And I hurry up and do it. And then all of a sudden, I'm infused with the power of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden now, I've got counter forces against the old man. I've got a new man now fighting the old man. And, and now when I feel like doing something, something comes out. Oh. Oh, well, yeah, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. <laughs> and I fight it. And then I have to admit it. I can't hide behind that don't move me. It's moving me all the time. And I'm about, quit some more. Stop again. Because this is the eternal struggle. This is why Paul said to die is gain. Because when you die, there is no more struggle. The spirit is released from the mortality of the flesh and all of its binding, holding, twisting nature. So, so to die, I don't have that fight anymore because he's removed the flesh. But none of us want to die, so we want to be in a struggle. We want to be in a struggle that we won't admit. Relationship. Relationship, you do things in relationship that you don't want to do. Then as that relationship grows, you do things in a relationship that you don't want to do, but you don't mind doing it. Then as a relationship grows, you do things you don't want to do, but you enjoy it. You don't want to do it, but you enjoy it. Ultimately, because your enjoyment is in seeing the individual happy who you're with. So I'm doing something out of sacrifice and I'm enjoying doing it because it's making that person happy. Ah, and, and, and relationship, they didn't preach it. They gave me a bunch of rules. They didn't teach me how to love Jesus. They didn't express how much he loved me. They dealt with the, with the, the judgment side instead of the love side. And, and, so, and, and so as I get ready to close, I, have, I was closing a while ago, now I'm getting ready to close. Uh, I understand I have learned over the years that you have to understand teachers out of their own psyche. And many of the young men that I deal with and even older men who are trying so hard to get on the field and get out on the road and they find it so impossible to do, it's because they can't shake their early teaching. They, they can't shake it. 
they've been formed in their early uh, sense to be so the word is exclusivity where most in certain arenas become a private club just a little yeah a religious private club where they don't change people who come in you have to come in the way they are or you can't get in they have no room for differences no flexibility scripturally psychologically they're locked they don't listen to others except to condemn I asked a question uh, and 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 they spend they spend their scriptural presentation explaining their declension. Should I say that again or just verbose? There is a message that goes forth that is expansive and inclusive. There is another message that explains why we're declining. Some are preaching to open up the kingdom. Some are preaching to explain why there's closed. And the only reason it's closing is because everybody is, that's leaving is going to hell. See, you got to understand the dynamics of what happens as things shift. If you don't understand the shift, see, I'm riding on a motorcycle with you and you're sitting on the back. When we're going, long as we're going straight, we have no problem. But when I got a turn, you can't be leaning over here when I'm turning this way. We talk in relationship here. I can't get up every Sunday and have a message on why the city of refuge is declining. Because I got to find fault with somebody why it's declining but if it's ex if it's inclusive and expansive then I'm preaching progression instead of regression in order to do that we got to face who we are and not judge Martha because we're no different We're no different. When you look at Old Testament characters and all of their weaknesses, don't judge them because we're no different. What God did was he put us in a different status when he took us from law and put us into grace. Closing on grace. Closing on grace. Because grace stimulates patience, long suffering, kindness, gentleness. That's all grace. That's all all of these temperance, all of these are all of these are kind things. All of these make relationships happen. Kindness, gentleness. Huh? Can you imagine that you did something just so terribly wrong? And the person who's dealing with you is gentle? I remember I bought a brand new BMW. Got a brand new BMW. Only BMW in Longview. The only one. 
uh, when I bought a 930 Turbo Porsche, the banker asked to come see it. They had never seen, didn't know what it was. And I had this BMW and just got the keys. You know, you got a new car, you're in your 20s, and you go out there and look at it, you know, just <laughs> open the garage, you just, you ain't even driving it, you know, just looking at the thing, you go back, go to sleep, sleep for a while, come back and just look at it. No dust, no dust on the car. Wife took the car out, went down bird song. went down bird song. you know bird song, cross marble, and went over to the other side, and all of a sudden I get a call. Your wife is in an accident. Oh, is, is she all right? Is she all right? And I got in the, on the bicycle and rode over to where she was. Just, just so loving, so, so gentle. <laughs> just so gentle, so loving. Holding her, she crying. So now I said, now, does he have insurance? Do have insurance? No insurance. How did the accident happen? She just went through the light of it, drove out in front of the man, wham, totally wrong. I'm holding love and trying. <laughs> Towed the car to the garage, come out there and looked at my car. <laughs> and, and just lost it. Why in the world couldn't you look to the other way and look the other way and look the other way and just lost it? Went off and, and you know, and verbally, you don't want to be in a verbal battle with me. Went off when I looked at the car. Just got on my little car. <laughs> Brand new, ain't gonna drive it. Can you imagine that sustained gentleness, no matter how you're feeling, that's relationship, kindness, no matter how you're feeling, particularly when other people who stick their nose in will say you're being used or you're a flunky but you're not in my relationship. That's why people have to be out of your relationship because they become little devils. People who intrude in your relationship are little devils because they're whispering things to you like the devil does to impede the quality of your relationship. In a relationship, you have to be kind. You have to be gentle. You have to be patient, long-suffering. You gotta be temperate. All of the qualities of the gift of the spirit is for relationship. Ain't got no rules. It ain't your car, my car, when we have a good relationship. It ain't your side of the bed, my side of the bed. Relationship, everything is mine. Everything is yours. That's why when he brings us into a relationship, he calls us joint heirs with Christ. Everything is his, everything is mine. Gideon used two names when he was fighting the enemy. He said, I strike this enemy in the name of the Lord and the name of Gideon. I can say in the name of Jesus and in the name of Noel, get out of my house. I'm a joint heir. We own it together. We own victory together. We own power together. Relationship. You had a relationship with Jesus. If you're in this house, you're not born again. Well, 
Well, who is he talking to, Donovan? I don't know who he's talking to. You come and talk to me about that. Bring that to me. And then we'll find out who's making the mockery because cause I, didn't, I didn't see no mockery tonight. I, I was looking for a vision and I, that, that didn't come up. If you're not born again, the Lord is calling you tonight. He's calling you. I saw the move of God on Sunday as he called and he called and he drew people into the kingdom. In the hour in which we live, we have to realize that salvation is critical for the soul. And salvation is a wonderful way to live this life. What is that song we were singing? Yes. Everybody stand. He said, here's the thing. I'm born of everything. Nothing at all. said, here's the thing, here's the thing, I want everything, everything, or nothing at all. 